All right, well, we are looking today at chapter 15, which deals with the topic of scientific reasoning. And a lot of the stuff in this chapter you're already familiar with from earlier in the course. We're going to kind of move through relatively quickly here. Uh, we start off with the concept of causality. And, of course, causality claims that there's a link between an action and an event. So the uh, example I've been using throughout the course, if I release the pen, then the pen is going to fall. Um, we see that every time I release that pen, that the resulting action is that the pen falls. And so we expect that there is a causation, a causality that exists between my releasing of the pen and that pen falling. However, uh, David Hume, the uh, Scottish philosopher of the 18th century, talks about what he calls the problem of induction. And that's because when we talk about causality, causality is based upon induction. The only reason that I expect that the release is going to come from the, or the drop is going to come from the release, is because every time that I've done it, that's exactly what's happened. So, I build up an expectation, I build up a habit, that every time I release the pen, it's going to fall. But, as we've seen with induction, um, it is simply a matter of guesswork. Because there is no logical reason, according to Hume, why the future should have to resemble the past. Many times it does, and that's where our knowledge base is going to come from. But there's no logical reason to believe that it has to. And there are many times where it doesn't. And so it could potentially be the case that the relationship between release and fall is merely a coincidence that's happened millions of times. Doesn't seem very likely, but the possibility is there that that could be the case, and that maybe it isn't really a causation. But the fact that it has happened so many times has led us to accept it. Um, and so we come to accept that there is a genuine causal link between uh, release and fall. On the other hand, as we learned in previous chapters, um, there is, of course, always a fallacy that we have to watch out for, um, <clears throat> which is referred to here as the questionable cause fallacy, or the post hoc fallacy. Let me put that on a single page here for you, make it a little bit easier to visualize. Um, the questionable cause or post hoc fallacy, what uh, you've also, I think, referred to as a false cause fallacy, <clears throat> occurs when one claims that just because one event follows another, that the first event caused the second. And the fact is that many times that isn't true. We had the example the one time about the um, cheerleaders wearing blue ribbons in their hair, and every time they do that, the football team loses. Well, that may be the case, but do we really imagine there being a genuine causal link between the color of ribbons in a cheerleader's hair and whether or not the team loses? Isn't it more likely that they lost because they were up against a better team or that the team is not very good to begin with? Uh, it doesn't seem logical. It's just that one thing happened after another. And even if it happened several times, that doesn't necessarily mean there's a genuine causal link. And so in science, we do rely upon the idea of causality, we do rely upon the idea of induction, but we have to be careful of this questionable cause fallacy, um, so that we're not just assuming that because one thing happened after another, that the first thing caused it. Within the realm of science, you probably have been taught from grade school onwards about this thing called the scientific method. The scientific method is the straightforward, official way in which scientists look at knowledge. And this is the way that we gain uh, knowledge within our theories of science. Point one, formulate a hypothesis. In other words, make a best guess based upon what you know of what you think is going to happen. Point two, make a prediction based upon that hypothesis. And thirdly, confirm the hypothesis. And so, <clears throat> I'm going to uh, 
formulate a hypothesis that there is a link between releasing a pen and its falling. And so I'll make the prediction that if I release the pen, the pen will fall. I will perform the experiment, and sure enough, the experiment is confirmed. I do it over and over again repeatedly, and before long I've come to the realization that I can legitimately say there is a causal link between release and fall. Now that's the official method, that's the official way of scientific method. <clears throat> Your book also mentions that within the guise of science or knowledge in general, that there is this concept that was created by the medieval philosopher William of Ockham called the principle of economy. It's also known as Ockham's razor because you're, well, because Ockham's the one who created it, but also because you're shaving away the excess and getting rid of the stuff that you don't actually need. <clears throat> the principle of economy basically says that entities are not to be multiplied beyond necessity. So all things being equal, you should always choose the simpler theory. Never make things more complicated than they have to be. Okay. And so as you're engaged in this scientific method, as you're formulating your hypotheses, there's no reason to create a lot of elaborate uh, concepts and ideas that aren't needed. You want to keep the theory as simple as it possibly can be. That's Occam's razor. Now, of course, if uh, having a more complex theory will gain you a greater degree of knowledge, then there's a reason for a more complex theory. But all things being equal, it makes sense that we would want to um, take the simpler theory at all times. Now, although your science books will tell you about scientific method and they may teach you about the principle of economy, one of the things that they frequently leave out is what is referred to as hypothetical deductive reasoning. <clears throat> hypothetical deductive reasoning is a common form of scientific reasoning that combines scientific method with background knowledge, entrenchment, interpretation, and predisposition. Essentially what this reminds us is that each human being is unique. We are born and raised in a different family, in a different community, uh, in a different faith, uh, with a different school. We are learning as we go through our life and hearing about all sorts of different things. And so each person's background knowledge is a little bit different from each other person's background knowledge. And those different factors come into play in such a way that they make us sometimes interpret information differently than someone else would. And we also, of course, have to take into account the idea of predisposition. Are we predisposed to see things in a certain way, or to believe one thing as opposed to another? See, science, the way it's taught to us in the textbooks, is that it's supposed to be pure but human nature is always there, and so we have to watch out for these sorts of things because if we're engaged in that act of scientific understanding and discovery, and we don't realize that we might have certain prejudices behind us that are interpreting the way we read things, then that can get in the way of <clears throat> discovering real knowledge. And I'll give you a really good example of that. I don't know if you guys are <clears throat> familiar with the site of um, Masada in uh, Israel. Um, I'm a, kind of an archaeology uh, buff. It's kind of my hobby. But uh, anyway, when we look at the site of Masada, uh, this is a natural rock outcropping that rises up about 1,300 feet out of the Judean desert. Now, at the end of the Jewish war in the first century, um, there were a group of zealots that w took refuge in this mountaintop fortress of Masada. And 5,000 Roman soldiers came and encircled this area. They wanted to take these individuals. Well, the people inside knew that although they could hold out for a while, 
they had the upper advantage of being, you know, having the high ground. They had the advantage of having good storehouses of food, water, and so forth. Eventually, the numbers, you know, a couple hundred Jews against 5,000 Romans, uh, along with the fact that they are essentially isolated uh, in that area without the ability to get in any fresh reinforcements, without the ability to get any uh, uh, fresh resources, they were going to lose. And they knew that if the Romans got in there, that the men would be slaughtered and the women and children would be taken into slavery. And so we are told in the writings, <clears throat> in the writings of Josephus that the individuals inside of Masada made the decision that they would commit essentially mass suicide, that they would take their own lives, that they would die for Kadesh Hashem, that they would be uh, willing to die the martyr's death, uh, rather than to allow themselves to be taken and defiled by the enemy. So, when Flavius Silva and the Roman legions made their way into Masada, what he found was not a group of cowering people waiting to be taken prisoner or killed. What he found was corpses, hundreds upon hundreds of corpses, and it essentially destroys his victory. Well, this becomes a very major national uh, rallying cry throughout Israel and the ancient world, even into the modern world. Well, anyway, uh, back in the 1960s, the archaeologist Yigil Yadin excavated this site at Masada, and of course, he went into it with the desire to prove the story of Josephus to be true. Um, and so when he engaged in his work, he found, amongst other things, this cave, which had a bunch of human remains within it. And he looked at these, he analyzed them, he looked at the situation, and he declared, these are the Jews who fought at Masada. These are those national heroes. And he made a huge deal out of this. Uh, President Menachem Begin, uh, in 1973, actually had these bones buried with full military honor based upon the say-so of Yigil Yaden. Now, 30 years later or so, in 19... I want to say 92... Uh, Shea Cohen, another archaeologist, is going to work in that same site. But he will see things that Yadin didn't. One thing he notices is that the cave where these bones were found also had animal bones within it, including pig bones. And the fact is, of course, that Jews are forbidden from eating pork. So it doesn't make sense that there would be pig bones found uh, on this site, that, that animal is unclean. Cohen has technology that Yadin didn't, and so he has carbon dating done. Um, what we discover is that those bones that were found and buried were not actually from the first century AD. They were from almost 4,000 years earlier, during the Chaldithic period in, in uh, Israel. Now, what's the point of this? The point is that if you are someone like Yadin, who comes into the scientific exp uh, expedition, not simply to say, here's what I want to discover, I want to find out the truth, I want to see what happened here, let's unveil the story of Masada. Yadin doesn't do that. He comes in with the mission of saying, I want to prove that this national heroic story is true. I want to prove that what Josephus uh, writes in his account is the truth. And so by going in it with that prejudice, with that predisposition, he reads the evidence in a way that supports the conclusion he wants to bring. Instead of, as a scientist should, simply looking at the evidence and then drawing the conclusion from it, which is what Cohen is going to do. You know, Cohen, I'm sure, would have loved to have confirmed what Yadin said. He would have loved to have been able to confirm the story of, of Masada. But by following the evidence, he discovers that, you know, what we had previously thought to be true was not. 
Uh, does that mean the story of Masada isn't true? No. But it means that the evidence that we thought we had to support it is not there. Maybe there's other evidence out there that future excavations will find. But at this point, we don't have the evidence to confirm uh, what Josephus has written. So anyway, we have to watch out in science for things like that. We want to try to go into it, not just in science, but really in all pursuits of knowledge. We want to go in it in such a way that um, we try to tone down those prejudices, those predispositions. Uh, we don't want to go into it saying, here's what I want to prove. We want to go into it saying, show me the evidence. And when I see the evidence, then I'll know what to do. Then I'll know how to read it. Okay? So that's basically it. There's no homework for this chapter, so you can enjoy a little, uh, little leisure time uh, in the time you would have normally done with that. But uh, if you have any questions about this, like always, feel free to email or to uh, write into the discussion board. And we'll talk to you uh, in a future video.